So what we're talking about today are vanilla beans. So vanilla, worth its weight in silver. And there's a very good reason for that. So the sort of colloquial term for vanilla, you know, in today's, you know, kind of slang vernacular is if something is vanilla, it's boring. Um, like, oh, that's so vanilla. Um, which I disagree that this would be boring because it's such an interesting story with vanilla from its start. And even now the market for vanilla, the, you know, the plant that makes vanilla is so interesting. I think it's far from, uh, I think if they should rename that, that vanilla is like interesting and complex. Anyway, I've got two different kinds of vanilla beans here. These are both grade B vanilla beans, which means that they're extract quality. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but this one is Madagascar. This is from Madagascar, which produces 80% of the world's vanilla. Um, it is so complex and smells so delicious. And this one is a Tahitian vanilla bean, which is a different species. It's still vanilla, but it's, um, it's a different species. So it smells fantastic, but it's a little bit less complex than the Madagascar ones. And you'll find the Tahitian ones are a lot cheaper to purchase online, but these are still expensive. Even when you buy these in bulk, this one was like $2.40 and this one was like $1.80. Um, and that was when I bought them in bulk. So that's in, you know, non-pretty packaging, just these vacuum packed, you know, but you can find some in like glass tubes or, you know, tied with special things. Um, these are uh, very expensive and I think they're well worth it. Uh, the only other spice that's more expensive than vanilla uh, is saffron, which is the stamen of a crocus flower. And we'll talk about that on another, on another, uh, another show. So let me show you um, where the, the, vanilla comes from, vanilla is actually an orchid. So it's the fruit of an orchid vine. So this is the flower of the bourbon vanilla species. Um, the Tahitian has a white flower. Um, it, well, it varies depending on uh, which variety, but this is the flower that um, needs to be pollinated in order for uh, a vanilla bean to grow. So let's see, is that turned the right way? No, that's the right way. <laughs> so vanilla beans, I want you to notice real quick here that little, those little spots right there um, that look like they might be bug eggs or something, they're not. It's actually a stamp, an individual stamp of this woman's farm um, because it's almost like um, branding a cow or a, or a horse or something to show that it's yours to prevent theft so that if they're stolen, you can go to the market and find your vanilla beans and prosecute the thief. That's how valuable they are. So um, initially, uh, most vanilla is actually native to Mesoamerica, but particularly Mexico, and was cultivated by Aztec peoples. So um, it's been, you know, cultivated for thousands of years. Um, it was taken to Europe from um, explorer Cortez, who discovered the new world. Um, he was a Spanish explorer and he actually brought back to Europe um, coffee, vanilla, among many, many other plants um, of interest. So um, the issue with it is that once you take the vanilla orchid out of Mexico, the pollinator to create, because the, the, um, the flower of the orchid needs to be pollinated in order for it to create that bean. And that is done by a very small bee. It's a euglacine bee. Um, they used to think it was a melopona bee and they'll, they'll hang out around the flowers, but they're unsure if the melopona species of bees have actually ever pollinated orchids. It's the euglacine bees that primarily pollinate them. Um, anyway, without that bee around, there's no way they couldn't figure out how to get the vanilla orchid to fruit. Um, and there was a horticulturalist a while back, a um, couple hundred years ago that tried to figure it out um, and could pollinate them, but it wasn't really successful. And then um, a young uh, enslaved boy actually figured it out. He took a long bamboo stick that's beveled and he moved part of the flower out of the way and pollinated itself and was able to actually 
create, um, to pollinate vanilla so that it could be grown outside of Mexico. So what is current day Mexico? Um, so that, I think he was around 12 or 13 years old when he did it too, which I think is completely fascinating. So, um, so now it can be cultivated worldwide, but the reason these guys are so expensive is because they're so labor intensive and they take a long time. So orchids are perennials or tropical perennials. They have to be in like 80 or 90% humidity and in constant moisture, but not too wet and not too dry. Um, they, uh, they grow, um, you basically propagate them from cuttings and they grow, they have to grow for at least three years before they can put off a vanilla bean. Um, but really their peak production starts between five and eight years. So it's a really major investment in your time to get the, the kind of vanilla orchid orchard going um, or plant plantation going. And so um, it just takes an investment in time and money to make it happen. Um, also, because they have to be pollinated by hand, the flower only opens for a day. And so they open in clusters um, where there'll be like a cluster of buds, kind of like other orchids. If you've ever seen like the Vanda orchids or um, the ones that are, you know, the real common ones where it's like one um, kind of spike coming out and then you have flower buds that open on different days. That's the same thing that happens with a vanilla orchid and you have to pollinate it on that day or it will wither and die and you won't get a vanilla bean. So you go through, pollinate each one and that has to be done every day, checked every day for like three months. And then after all of those are pollinated, the, um, the bean grows and it's this beautiful green bean. And then uh, lovely farmers like this go through and they stamp every single bean. These also all ripen at different times, just like the flowers come out at different times. And so you have to wait till it starts to turn a little bit yellow on the end and barely starts to split and then it's time to pick it. But the rest of them won't be ripe at that time. So you have to go through the orchard again and again and again until you get all of the beans off of here. Because if they split before you pick them, um, then they're not good anymore. I mean, they're good, would be good for extract or something, but they're not as valuable. And so that's why, um, you know, it's just, you have to be on top of your orchard all the time. It's not like an apple orchard where you, you know, set out your apples and you go out a couple times a year to harvest and, and um, fertilize. It's a lot more complicated than that. So that's why they're, they're pretty pricey. Um, so the, they're almost as expensive. They're just about the price of silver. Um, and I'm not talking about like silver jewelry, more like uh, their weight in silver. And so, um, you know, that's, it's, they're, they're pretty pricey, but they're definitely worth it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about fake vanilla. Okay. So the, the smell that you smell when you sniff vanilla is primarily vanillin which let me show you, I wrote that down. This is for you visual learners. Well, I did, I said it somewhere. Um, vanillin is um, what is sort of like generic vanilla flavor. It doesn't have the complexity of a vanilla bean because it's sort of like the strongest scent in vanilla is vanillin. But a vanilla bean has many other um, compounds that give it flavor, which is why the Tahitian vanilla, it smells great, but it doesn't have near the vanillin content or um, you know, all sorts of other compounds and congeners in a Madagascar vanilla bean that give it its flavors. So vanillin. So vanillin, although naturally occurring in beans, it can also be synthesized from coal tar, petroleum products like crude oil, and wood pulp. So when you see vanillin on a, you know, on a, a package of something, um, they can't call this natural flavor because it's not, it's artificial flavor. It's naturally occurring in a vanilla bean, but it's artificial flavor um, in, in vanillin. Um, so just know that if you see this on something, um, they're cutting it with uh, true vanilla sometimes. Like if you get uh, what's called Mexican vanilla, like People say, oh, Mexican vanilla is the best. And my grandmother used to actually drive south across the border to buy big bottles of this Mexican vanilla. And you open it up and it smells great. It's not as complex as a vanilla bean. And then you turn it over on the side and it has some natural vanilla in it. And then it has vanilla in added to it. So uh, Cook's Illustrated did uh, a test of baked goods to see if anyone could tell the difference between vanillin and natural vanilla. 
And when they did like brownies and cookies, people couldn't really tell the difference. Uh, but um, when you did, they did ice cream or any kind of cold applications like frosting, they could absolutely tell the difference. So if you wanted to cut costs, uh, keep your true vanilla for uh, for your cold applications, yogurts, things like that. And then you can use the vanillin for um, the baked applications. Or you could just make your own vanilla extract because it's pretty easy to do. So I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. Because it's easy and it's fun. Okay, so we have our vanilla beans. Um, these are grade B. Uh, the grade A vanilla beans are larger, plumper, usually a little bit lighter in color. Um, those ones you can sometimes still see their stamp on them, which is really neat. Um, but I just went ahead and got the grade B ones because they're cheaper and they smell just as great. And I'm not going to be using it in a like cold application. I'm going to, I'm going to be using this um, just for extract. Uh, the oils in here, the flavoring compounds are fat soluble, which means they need to be dissolved in a solvent of some kind or in fat. So um, you can like if you're say you're going to make vanilla ice cream or something you would take this and put it in the cream and let it like steep in the cream and the fats are going to absorb the flavor from the pod so if you were going to do that sort of application what you would do is you're going to split the vanilla bean down the middle and inside it exposes a bunch of tiny little seeds and what you would do is scrape it with your knife and the seeds have a flavor, but it's primarily this stuff that holds the seeds together that has contains the most vanillin content. So this you would stir into your milk or cream. You drop the pod in there as well because there's oils in the pod. And then you would strain this part out and you'll see the little black specks in there. But we're gonna be making vanilla extract. So um, what we would do is cut, you don't have to scrape because you're going to be steeping this for a long time. Um, and then you're going to cut it in half so it fits into your bottle. So I went ahead and got some four ounce bottles, ordered them on Amazon. Um, but there's a lot of different companies out there that sell these sort of bottles. Um, these are nice and clean. Um, now, you, since we're, we have to use some sort of solvent that's going to mix with oil, there's a couple of different things that you can do. So I brought some vodka to mix mine in. It has to be a minimum of 80 proof vodka, rum, bourbon, whatever kind of alcohol you wanna use, but it needs to be ethanol, the edible kind, um, not isopropyl rubbing alcohol. Do not do that, that's very bad. It's not good to eat, it's not edible. So it has to be ethanol, which is the sort of active ingredient in all cocktails. So, um, you would go with uh, vodka's nice because you just get the flavor of the vanilla bean, but you can do like rum or bourbon or something so that you can add more. Sometimes people like to use like, you know, um, you know, brown butter and bourbon frosting and things like that. That would be an excellent extract. Like if you're going to order 10 vanilla beans online, you can use different alcohols to um, impart different flavors to your baked goods. So, um, but today we're gonna work with vodka. Another thing that you can do because vodka um, with alcohol, there are some people who uh, cannot have alcohol in their food, either um, recovering addicts or possibly uh, there's certain religions that don't allow it. Like for instance, um, Muslim folks, they don't, if they practice halal eating, then they can't have alcohol. So what you can do is make a non-alcohol extract of it with vegetable glycerin. So I have two containers of vegetable glycerin and don't worry about the brand name on these, that's not the point. One is food safe and one is not, so or food grade. So I don't think it would hurt you if you ate this one and it even says natural sweetener and tells you how to use it as a natural sweetener. But this one is kosher, food grade, non-GMO, yada, yada, yada. So food grade is what you wanna go for on this just to make sure. Um, glycerin is um, not water, it's water soluble and fat soluble. It is from the byproduct of two primary things that we do in the US and that's soap making, um, soap or detergent making. And the other one is um, making a uh, processing of biofuels. 
So if you're doing transesterification or saponification, uh, saponification being the make of soap, transesterification is what you do when you turn plant oils into biofuels. So if you have plant-based biodiesel or, eth or ethanol production that we put in our, um, in our cars, this is going to be a uh, byproduct of that. And so um, the reason that you want the food grade is that it has been steam distilled and it's at least 99.5% pure so that you can make sure that it's safe to eat. Um, since this can come, uh, glycerin can come, so I'm sorry, excuse me, saponification, you can do that with any kind of oil. You can do it with lard, you can do it with palm oil, you can do it with olive oil, anything that's an oil or a fat, you can, um, get glycerin from. Um, the reason this says kosher is because it comes from plant sources. And so what I would do, you know, if you're trying to, um, you know, make vanilla extract for the masses and you don't really know if people are halal or not or kosher or not, just go halal or kosher. Most things that are uh, pretty much all things that are kosher are also halal, um, which means allowed basically or approved um, for eating and lifestyle. And so that means that it wasn't made with any uh, pork fats. That's the primary issue is is um is pork because that doesn't go in either either diet um, for kosher or halal so if you're going to go this route what you would do is three parts glycerin one part water and then drop your beans in there okay but we're going to go ahead and go with the vodka Ooh, one other dietary restriction um, if you are making vanilla extract for gifts make sure whatever alcohol you use is gluten free because you never know who's going to end up eating it if it goes into somebody's house. You may know your friends are not gluten-free, but they may do some gluten-free baking for someone or make a gluten-free ice cream and you actually have gluten in here. So that often happens with vodkas that are made from wheat, um, but you can get vodka that's made from um, potatoes. I mean, all kinds of things. All it is, is is like pure alcohol. So anything that's a sugar source, they can make it out of. Um, so let's go ahead and make some. So what I'm going to do is split these down the middle and cut them in half. just so they fit in my bottle. And when I have them split, it exposes um, more of their surface area so that the alcohol can extract the deliciousness. Okay, so in the half, and I'm gonna drop them in here. Okay, got a little stuff in there. And then get a handy dandy little, well, you don't have to have a funnel, but it really does help. Um, now you don't need to buy expensive vodka for this. This is expensive vodka because it's all I had in the house and I didn't want to go to the liquor store before this, but uh, just buy the cheap stuff because you're going to be extracting and then you're going to cook it out. So it's not like you need to spend $40 for a liter of alcohol for this. You can get the, you know, kind of rot gut stuff if you want. We're just going to fill it up. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to shake this every couple weeks, keep it in a dark, um, a dark place. It's really great if you can make this in colored bottles, um, but this is what was available, so I got it. Just give it a little shake. You can start using this in about two months, but if you can wait six months to a year, oh, beautiful. So you might want to, if you want to give this as gifts this year, um, go ahead and make them and then um, put on them, you know, start using at such and such a time. Usually I tell people when I give these to them, once the alcohol goes below the level of the, um, the beans, pull them out. Um, or just keep topping it off with alcohol and you can refill this quite a few times and keep steeping it and it will continue to extract deliciousness out of the beans. So um, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and this, this costs probably around $6 um, with the container and everything and the alcohol um, and the beans. Um, whereas something like this would cost between 10 and $20 if you got it in the store and you can't refill the one you get in the store, so. Okay, now real quick, because we only have a few minutes before we ask questions, I wanted to do the chili of the week. Okay, this one's really exciting um, because it looks like it would burn you. So, but it doesn't. This is called a habanada. Um, and habanada, what this is, is a habanero without any spice in it. And it was bred by a Cornell University plant breeder um, named Michael Marozek. 
and he loved habaneros and he wanted to be able to share them with his friends and family and not have them burn their faces off. So this is like very complex, very fruity and tropical. And when you bite into it, there's a scent that goes on your nose that you're going to wait a second and expect for it to burn. And it never does. So, I mean, this is a sweet, delicious, beautiful pepper. Um, I don't know if it comes true to seed or not. I don't know if it's open pollinated. I don't think it is. So if you saved seeds from it, especially if you had other peppers growing nearby and you had a hot pepper growing nearby, you might end up having a spicy one afterwards. But let me show you how it's spelled. It's kind of cute. Habanada and habanero. So, Habanada, he named it that because nada means nothing in Espanol and habanero. So it's a habanero without any spice in it. I thought that was just the cutest thing. But um, I don't usually grow in my own garden a whole bunch of little tiny peppers because you get so much more food off of um, off of some of the peppers that grow really tall and they put off as many peppers as if they're like a hot pepper bush, but they're all sweet. But this one, I'll definitely grow because you can eat them whole. The seeds taste just as good as the flesh does. It smells like it's gonna burn you, but it doesn't, it's totally sweet. So I highly recommend this one if you can get your hands on some of them. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions about um, extracts or where this grows or vanilla wars or anything. <laughs> Great. That was all really interesting. So let me see what our first question is. All right. So the first question is, could you remind us the, um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to read two things at once. Okay. <laughs> could you remind us the um, number of beans per the amount of alcohol? Yes. Oh, thank you for asking. So this is, this is two beans per four ounces of alcohol. You could double stack this or double fold it, they call it, where you put four beans in here. You absolutely could. It's pretty pricey, but you can use it sooner. Um, it's just depending on, you know, how much you want to spend on, on your, your beans. And then the next question that was distracting me is where can you find the habanero? And I wonder if she means the habanero, but maybe the, hab the habanada. The yeah. habanada, yes. <laughs> well, I ended up growing these. I don't even know where you can buy them. Um, I was at the state farmer's market yesterday and there are a lot of people with a lot of peppers out there and they're about three or $4 a pound. Um, yeah, these they're all kicking off like crazy right now because it's the end of the season and all of the peppers are crashing and burning because we have a frost. Um, so I would call around and see if they've got them, but they're, they're relatively rare. I mean, these seeds are like 50 cents each because they're they're rare and they're, they, they only came available in like 2015 or 2016. So they're a relatively new pepper. Um, and, you know, the guy bred them and, you know, he's, since they're like kind of a specialty pepper, they just, they cost a little more. But since you know the guy that bred them, if you don't have a good germination, right, you could just send him an email at Cornell and say, hey, <laughs> help the sister out. Uh, anyway, yeah, I, I, I grew these. These are actually growing at Briggs. That's, that's why I have them. Um, but next year in my own garden, I'm going to grow like four or five of these plants because I would love to ferment them and then add some other hot chilies. Could can you imagine the color of this in a hot sauce? would be beautiful. Yeah. Mm, awesome. Um, our next question is, does vanillin have any health benefits? You know, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, glycerin does. There's a whole bunch of crazy stuff about glycerin that I didn't talk about. Glycerin sort of like baking soda. It's got 5 million uses. You can eat it, you can, personal care products, yada, yada. But um, vanillin, I don't think it does, except for, this is me just speculating here, when you bite something and it tastes so delicious that you have a serotonin reaction in your brain and it lowers your blood pressure. That's just me saying that I'm not a doctor, uh, but I'm not aware of any um, uh, sort of research out there about it. Oh, there's one other compound I forgot to mention that they use for vanilla and it's not very much. They only produce about 300 pounds of it a year, but it's excretion from, there's some, not really glands, but, um, from a beaver's rear end that smells like, when they mark their territory, it smells like vanilla musk all through the forest. And apparently people extract this, they, they anesthetize beavers and extract this compound. I, what is it called? Castorium. 
oh my gosh. And I was like, oh, and we eat about 200, I mean, 2.6 million pounds of vanilla a year. And they only produce 300 pounds of this castorium per year. But I was a little bit surprised. So if you've got a real vanilla musky perfume, there's not a lot of people who use it in food because there's not that much produced. And if anybody found out that there was beaver excretions in their, you know, vanilla ice cream, they'd probably never buy it again. Uh, but they do use it in perfume. I thought that was kind of interesting. Wow. So no, wow. I don't know any vanilla <laughs> research. Sorry, that was a bit of a... <laughs> um, okay, so then we have uh, just a comment. When I went to Mexico, there's a lot of people who were selling vanilla. Now I see why. Yep. <laughs> Yep, this one's cheap and easy. And, you know, I think that Mexico used to be known for vanilla because that was one of the few places you could get it. Um, it was a major uh, vanilla producing region. Um, and now it's it's Madagascar that produces 80% in, in the world um, and it's all hand pollinated. But um, but yeah, I mean, my, my grandma did the same thing. She'd go down and get Mexican vanilla. And then as I got older and I found out about coal tar and whatnot and all the weird, strange things that corporations put in food, I was blown away by that. So I actually have artificial vanilla in our, um, in our pantry here at the food lab just for classes. I teach a four hour, three hour class called Sugar and Spice. And we go through two or 300 different spices, herbs, salts, sugars. Um, and, and I keep that in what I call our food museum of stuff to look at, uh, but never eat, so. Wow, I can't wait till we get back from COVID and we can all do that again. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> um, so another comment, I think, so we grew these habanadas that you gave us at seeds and we put them in our pickled peppers. Oh, they have great flavor and definitely soak up the spiciness from the other peppers. Can't wait to make hot sauce of them. Mm. I'm so glad you got some of those plants, my seeds, kids. Yay! Yay. That's really cool. All right, let me see my next one. Okay, so if you have vanilla seeds, are there anything else you can do with them besides make vanilla extract? Mm, well, it's mainly, you know, people will use it in like perfumery. So, you know, you could make like a room spritz out of it. I mean, you could just take this and strain it in or stick a sprayer in the top of this and you could, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's mainly like flavoring. You can um, put it in an atomizer and mix it with water and then, you know, scent the air with it. Um, you can put it in lotions. It would be fine in lotions. It's just that, um, you'd probably be better off doing like the extract in a lotion. You just can't do it in any heat application. Like I'm a hot so hot process soap maker and you can't take vanilla and throw it in hot process soap. It burns off really fast and the flavor is never there. Um, oh, another fun thing you can do that I forgot to mention. So you can take a vanilla bean and put it in a container of sugar and it will flavor the sugar. So that's a really nice way to, and it'll last for years in there. Um, so you can either split it and put it in there, which kind of flavors it a little bit faster, um, or you can just stick a couple of vanilla beans in a big, like a jar of sugar, and you'll always have vanilla sugar. Ooh, that's really, really nice. Um, I have about, I have time for like one more question. So I have a lot of attendees today and I'd love to have someone raise their hand and ask us a question out loud. If I can tempt you to do that, maybe you'll get an extra, extra dose of vanilla beans in your, in your treat today. If you do that, can't get anyone <laughs> to do, I can't get any takers. All right, let me just check Facebook one more time. So it looks like we may be out of questions today, Sherilyn, and almost out of time. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we're gonna be taking next week off for the Thanksgiving holiday, but we'll be back and going strong every Wednesday um, until Thanksgiving. So, um, I mean, I mean, until Christmas uh, or the holiday, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and then we'll start again in the new year. So thanks everybody for coming. It was really fun. And I look forward to seeing my seeds kids. I'll come bring you some vanilla beans. Awesome, thank you, Sherilyn. Have a great afternoon. Bye.